Uh, but, but how would anybody know that in May of 1939? And so to blame the United States or the Jewish community for not speaking up about the passages on St. Louis is, is uh, really sheer idiocy would be a good, a good term for it. Um, you just can't know anything about history and say that unless you believe that Franklin Roosevelt and the, all the Ameri leadership in America knew in May of 39 that when they went back to Europe, they knew that Hitler was going to take over, not only defeat France, um, but engage in a mass extermination of the Jews and build concentration camps, none of which had ever been discussed by anyone. Or, or, you, you, you would have been insane if you had said that in 1939. So, so, that, so, so much for the, uh, the St. Louis. Um, here's our boy here. Um, but, but the question is, but, but, but the question is, why do we not let the passengers of the St. Louis in? In other words, we're such a great country. We let Im immigrants. Um, these people were desperate. Um, Crystal Knight, 1938, the Germans made it very clear the Jews could not continue living in Germany. Uh, they burned down all the synagogues, trashed all the buildings. So in 1938-39, it was very clear that German Jews and Austrian Jews had to get out of Germany. So why didn't we take them? We should have taken them, right? Well, a perfectly good argument, except that if you go back and look at your American history, everyone in this room learned this in high school. In the 1880s, this country started going through all sorts of changes. We had, we had an open immigration policy. We let in anybody. They even let in all my grandparents. Um, and um, you know, they all came from Belarus, Poland, and Russia. But they also let in Italians, Poles, uh, a lot of Slavs, and a lot of people that white Anglo-Saxon America did not know what to make of. Uh, Y'all, many people in this audience are old enough to remember there was a great discrimination against not just the Jews, but the Italians, the Poles, Slavs. I mean, the fear of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, I mean, we can all sit back in 2009 and put our head in the sand, but the fact of the matter is, uh, America, a lot of Americans did not want these people in the country. They didn't realize that there were millions of Jews in New York, millions of Poles in Chicago, millions of Italians, and, and they didn't like it. And so laws were passed in 1921, 1924, which limited the, the cutoff immigration to this country, basically. Basically what they said was, we don't want the country looking like this. Um, you know, being Jewish, we all have such an affectionate feeling about the Lower East Side. But the Lower East Side was one of the most crime-ridden, poor health hazards that ever existed you know, on the North American continent. And it's wonderful to dream about it, but th there were Jewish criminals, there were terrible problems with health problems, and, 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 and the Italians, of course, I don't even need to get into that. Y'all have all watched um, The Godfather and everything else. And, um, and I mean, no, people really, uh, I say people, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Americans, particularly Southerners and Midwesterners, um, were not, did, did not like what was going on. And you might also remember the Haymarket bombing in Chicago in 1886. You know, communism, socialism, anarchism, these were the terrorists of the time. Uh, President McKinley was assassinated by a Polish anarchist. I mean, we're not worried about anarchists, you know, we're worried about a different group of terrorists right now, but they were worried about these things. And that made Teddy Roosevelt president, by the way. And the rise of the Communist Party, which, by the way, the Bolshevik Revolution was not a minor event. I mean, the Bolshevik Revolution sent tremors down the spines of, of everyone in the Western world, France, Britain, and the United States. So these laws were in place. Anti-Semitism played a role. I have no question about it. But anti-Catholicism played a role, and they cut out immigration from Italy. Basically, they didn't want any more Southern and Eastern Europeans, they wanted Northern Europeans. So they limited immigration to 150,000 people a year from, guess where? Germany, Great Britain, and Scandinavia, because they wanted the country to look like they thought that it should, it should look. The Statue of Liberty would stand in New York Harbor, one historian wrote, but the verses on its base would henceforth be but a tribute to a vanished ideal. Uh, and listen to this. You know the debate we have going on in the country now about immigration. And the country is bitterly divided on this. Um, it, it, probably everybody in this room can make the argument for letting 13 million Mexicans stay in the country, and the other half can make the argument against it. Um, I'm pretty much in favor of it, because they built my driveway, my law office, and everything. They really work very hard. 
but I can see how people don't like it. I mean, the point is, it's a legitimate debate. It's a legitimate debate. We should be able to control our own borders. Well, look, we'll look, at, the, look at the vote in, in 1924. Uh, the 62 to 6 in the Senate and 326 to 71 in the House. Now, that's a pretty big consensus. Uh, Roosevelt ran for vice president before he ran for president, was defeated by uh, Cool Coolidge or Harding, who signed the immigration law of 21, Coolidge signed the law of 24. So the law that Roosevelt gets blamed for is enacted by the very men who defeated him for the presidency. And this was a consensus. I mean, the president can't just tell Congress what to do. I mean, if you're Obama, you can do it. But I mean, other presidents can't do it. Um, I voted for Obama. Right. Um, when Hitler came to power in 1933, um, the, and began persecuting Jews, America was no longer an asylum. We just were not an asylum for immigrants. We like to think we were, but we weren't. This quota system was in effect. Roosevelt had no power to let the St. Louis passengers in. And, and basically, Congress was not going to change these laws in the midst of the Great Depression. I mean, look at the situation now. Americans are screaming and yelling about jobs. Look at Great Britain. You have people in Great Britain in the streets going, you know, throw the foreigners out. We want the jobs for the British. Well, this is exactly what was going on um, in the 30s. Um, we, we, we have to keep in mind that the Great Depression, somehow when people write about the Holocaust, they just conveniently forget about immigration laws, the Depression, and World War II. And it's great. If you can write and blame people and ignore you know, these giant elephants in the room. The Great Depression was a pretty bad thing. My grandfather went into bankruptcy. They, they got through, but I mean, it wasn't a wonderful time. Um, I don't have to tell you about the Depression. Um, crops rotting in the fields. I mean, we all know how, how bad the country was. Um, I, I know we're in bad shape now, but when Franklin Roosevelt was sworn in as president, um, he didn't worry about giving Citigroup a bonus. The, all the banks were closed. The banks were closed. You couldn't get your money out. Okay? So, I mean, why people forget basic American history, I don't know. Um, there was no possibility of the United States amending these immigration laws. And um, the passengers on the St. Louis, by the way, were just another group of people who at that time were being persecuted by the Nazis. You know, the Nazis persecuted a lot of people. They, they persecuted the intelligentsia, anti-fascists, socialists, labor leaders, uh, people who had fought in the Spanish Civil War. All these people were trying to get into America. Now, let me talk for a minute about Kristallnacht, um, which um, the German word is Kristallnacht, which is the night of broken glass. Um, the Germans decided to destroy the Jewish community about 1938 in this pogrom. Roosevelt recalled our ambassador to Germany, the only world leader to do that. Actually, the only world leader to speak out against the Nazis. Well, we all know the French. I, I, I don't even have to go on about that. And then the, uh, uh, the British, Neville Chamberlain, there's a great name that will live forever in infamy. I mean, you know, he, isn't, he, he wasn't going to criticize the Germans. So who was, who was standing up to Adolf Hitler in 1938? Franklin Roosevelt. He said he was shocked by the actions of the Nazis. I myself could scarcely believe that such things could occur in a 20th century civilization. No United States ambassador ever returned to Germany until after the war. Now, this is in 1938. The American people were not going to go to war. 80% of them said we weren't going to go fight. Charles Lindbergh and the America First Committee was out there saying we shouldn't fight. But Roosevelt with recalled the ambassador and made a statement. You can say it's just words, but recalling an ambassador is, is a statement.